Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Dimitrios Lignos. I'm uh, going to present the uh, second week of structural dynamics uh, with application to seismic engineering class. And in particular, this week we will start with a review on structural dynamics uh, with the emphasis on linear and non-linear systems. And uh, we're going to also go through uh, the uh, uh, concept of the elastic response spectrum which is essential for uh, applications to uh, seismic engineering, as we will see. Uh, so the objective of uh, today's lecture will be to uh, introduce the response of uh, single degree of freedom systems to earthquake excitation, which is the primary focus of seismic engineering. Uh, we are going to uh, also see the numerical evaluation of the dynamic response. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the effect of dynamic properties of single degree of freedom systems on earthquake excitations. And uh, eventually I will uh, talk about the response spectrum of linear systems, which is going to be essential uh, to compute the seismic action uh, that is necessary to uh, uh, compute the uh, uh, seismic forces on a structural system. Uh, during uh, earthquake design, which is something that we're going to see extensively from uh, pretty much a week for uh, and after. Uh, then I will talk about the response of inelastic single degree of freedom systems. I uh, will try to link this with a concept called allowable ductility. And uh, finally, I will uh, talk about the uh, strength reduction factors uh, or the what we call behavior factor in Europe, uh, which is a concept that uh, is being used for the seismic design of uh, structures uh, that reduce seismic loading. Uh, so as you may recall from uh, typical structural dynamics, uh, if I have a single degree of freedom system, such as the one that uh, we see here in the figure, uh, so here in the figure, so uh, when uh, this is subjected to a ground excitation uh, that has uh, an acceleration series U double dot ground, uh, I can uh, express equilibrium in the system by using uh, Newton's uh, second law, uh, where uh, the uh, Newton's second law is going to tell us that the uh, internal forces in the system that are comprised of the inertia forces, Fi, as well as the damping forces, as well as the restoring forces, uh, have to be equal to the external load. And uh, in this case, the uh, external load is essentially uh, comprised by the inertial forces that are exert, um, created by the uh, ground acceleration multiplied by the corresponding mass of uh, the uh, structure that I'm actually investigating. So in this case, there's a minus sign here uh, because uh, when the ground moves to the left, the structure anticipates to move to the right. And uh, in this case, the equilibrium will yield to mass times relative displacement, uh, second derivative of uh, relative displacement, which is acceleration, plus uh, damping coefficient times velocity, plus uh, stiffness times the uh, uh, relative displacement, will be equal to minus m u w dot uh, g. Uh, this is a second order differential equation, and if you recall, in order to be able to solve it, we have to know two initial conditions. And in our case, we assume that the uh, system uh, t equals zero prior to the uh, earthquake event is actually experiencing uh, a zero displacement, or uh, displacement equal at u zero. And uh, the initial velocity is also u dot uh, zero. And of course, when the system is at rest, both of these values will be equal to zero. So uh, for a given uh, base excitation, the uh, deformation response uh, ut of the single degree freedom system depends on the uh, natural period of the uh, oscillator and uh, the corresponding damping ratio. Uh, this is why two linear systems that they have the same period 
and the same dumping ratio will have the same exact deformation uh, even though one system may be more massive than the other or may be more stiff than the other. Uh, here, uh, if I would like to uh, uh, work a little bit with this equation before, <laughs> excuse me, if I actually divide the all terms with uh, the mass term here, I will have that uh, u w dot plus c over m times u prime plus k over m times u is equal to minus u w dot uh, g. And uh, uh, if you recall from uh, structural dynamics, the circular frequency of an oscillator is equal to the square root of uh, its stiffness divided by the mass. And the uh, dumping ratio Z is equal to uh, the uh, dumping coefficient C divided by 2M times omega N, which is the critical dumping coefficient. So if I use these uh, relationships here, I can uh, rewrite uh, here the equation based on uh, Newton's second law uh, to um, U double dot plus 2G omega N u prime plus omega n squared times u equal to minus u double dot uh, ground. And uh, my initial conditions are actually going to be the same. So uh, if I go back on slide, so what happens here is that uh, the right-hand side of this equation that represents the uh, ground excitation essentially uh, corresponds a time series. And this time series uh, could look like here the uh, time series that has been recorded during the Canoga Park record from uh, Northridge 1994 earthquake in California, or could look like the uh, completely different record like the Yanuma record in 2011 uh, recorded during the uh, Tohoku earthquake. Uh, the, the, the point here is that earthquake excitations are completely random, and so the input motion is actually uh, represented by a random time series. And uh, if I want to go back to uh, the equation here, I cannot really solve this equation analytically as I would be able to do uh, if I had a, a regular second order differential equation. So uh, to be able to solve this equation, I will need to use a numerical technique. And uh, if you recall, these numerical techniques that we typically use uh, could be uh, two primary uh, types uh, that I will talk about in a minute. The uh, problem, the point here is that the numerical methods, <coughs> sorry, response is evaluated at the uh, discrete time step ti based on the equations of motion that I uh, actually uh, wrote back at the uh, time step i and i plus one. And uh, for each time step, I'm going to have to compute my solution uh, by uh, essentially using information from previous and current steps. And uh, here, uh, you see a snapshot of uh, how this uh, predicted response will look like. And uh, what you should recall from structural dynamics class is that uh, essentially you're not predicting a continuous uh, function, but you're predicting what happens at discrete uh, points. And uh, the number of points depend on the solution step you're, uh, step you're selecting, uh, which is something that we have to uh, consider uh, throughout the solution. Um, now, one of the techniques that uh, we usually use to uh, uh, compute our solution is the central difference method, uh, where uh, this method is based on a finite difference approximation of the time derivatives of the uh, displacement. And in particular, first derivative of displacement will be uh, velocity, so we approximate velocity. And the second derivative of displacement is going to be acceleration. So again, we have to approximate the acceleration. Uh, now, if we take uh, constant steps 
delta ti equal to delta t between step i and step i plus one. The central difference uh, expression for the velocity and acceleration uh, for uh, time step i are going to be expressed uh, with the actual central difference uh, uh, derivative approximation as u prime i equal to u i plus i minus u i minus i divided by the two delta t. And similarly for the second derivative of u uh, times step i, uh, essentially I will have u i plus one minus two times u i plus u i minus one divided by delta two delta t uh, squared. So if I go uh, back to my, uh, if I go back to the equation here, and now I uh, replace the first term with the second expression, as well as the second term with the first expression, uh, I can uh, uh, rewrite the equation of motion by considering the uh, derivative approximations in this case. And uh, uh, as you see, where I have m times u double dot, I'm going to have the first expression, whereas c plus u prime at step i is going to be substituted with the second expression. So in this equation, uh, ui and ui minus 1 are assumed to be known. Uh, and uh, then with that, I can predict what's happening in the next step. So if you recall, uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, write the algorithm uh, properly, uh, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm doing a substitution of uh, after regrouping the equation into terms, uh, with k hat here being this expression that uh, mass and damping coefficient are actually uh, uh, known. Uh, delta t here is uh, the solution step that I am uh, deciding to use. Uh, so k prime, k hat is a constant that has been defined by uh, pretty much known quantities. Uh, and on the right hand side here, I'm going to call p bar i essentially the expression that is uh, being highlighted here from the bracket. So if I want to find my uh, next step in terms of relative displacements, all I have to do is that uh, I will have to divide the p bar uh, with respect to uh, uh, k bar. Uh, so uh, therefore, the unknown displacement for step i plus 1 is going to be given by this uh, expression. Now observe that the known displacements ui and ui minus 1 are used to compute the ui plus 1. This is why u0 and u at minus 1 have to be computed so that they can be able to compute the first step. So the specified initial displacement u0 is known from the problem because this corresponds to the initial value problem. So if I have a structure at the rest conditions, it means that at t equals 0, this structure is going to uh, displace uh, once the earthquake comes, but prior to the arrival of the earthquake, uh, I can assume that it doesn't have any initial displacement. <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, in order to use the central difference method, I will have to go through some steps. So I'm going to have to calculate what's happening at i equals 0 by uh, computing these expressions here. And uh, I will have to approximate my uh, u underscore minus 1 with a Taylor approximation uh, that is a second order approximation. And uh, if you recall from structural dynamics, uh, if I have that, I can compute the acceleration at time uh, 0 uh, based on uh, this expression here. And finally, uh, the central difference method uh, will not converge in the presence of a numerical round of uh, errors if the time step you're choosing is not short enough so that it can satisfy the stability criteria. So when we say short enough, essentially 
uh, that uh, means that uh, your uh, solution step here should be uh, such that uh, uh, should be so your solution step should be such <laughs> that uh, delta t over the uh, predominant period of the oscillator has to be smaller than one over pi. So if uh, your oscillator has a period here of one second, your delta t should be, for instance, smaller or equal to one over pi. Usually the uh, stability condition is going to control if you are dealing with very stiff structures where the predominant period of a stiff structure is going to be uh, very small. For instance, if you are dealing with low rise uh, structures that they have uh, reinforced concrete walls, in this case, uh, you should anticipate a period that could be in the range of 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. So if you take 0.1 to 0.2 seconds and then you divide with pi, obviously that will correspond to a smaller uh, delta t. Now, uh, to apply the uh, central difference method, uh, the implementation algorithm has been given in structural dynamics. And I have my initial conditions where I described just now. Uh, and then I'm going to have to do the calculations for a time step i. And these calculations essentially uh, will involve the computation of p bar. That is a function of my pi minus a times u i minus 1 minus b ui, where a and b or alpha and beta are basically defined in the initial conditions. Uh, the ui plus 1 as we said, it's been computed as p bar divided by i, uh, so at step i divided by k bar. And if required, uh, you can approximate the velocity at step i as well as the acceleration at step i uh, by the uh, two expressions that were given earlier uh, based on the central difference method. Uh, finally, uh, you can repeat for the next time step by replacing i to, uh, with uh, i plus 1. And uh, step 2 should be repeated as many times as you need so that you can compute, compute the entire response that you would like to see during an earthquake. Uh, so uh, if the excitation that we use is the ground motion that we discussed earlier, which is what we are interested in here in the seismic engineering class, uh, pi is going to be replaced by minus m u w dot g. And the computed response, since it is relative to the ground, I will have to watch out because uh, if I need the uh, absolute velocity acceleration and displacement, then I'm going to have to add what the ground is giving me with respect to these two quantities. And here you see how you can get pretty much the uh, total velocity and total acceleration for step i um, uh, by using the relative quantity plus the uh, ground quantity. If you recall, in earthquake engineering, uh, the uh, quantity of interest here is that uh, we should be worried about in, in terms of absolute uh, value is uh, the uh, total acceleration that uh, is also used to construct our uh, uh, response spectrum uh, and eventually the one that we use to uh, construct uh, an elastic design spectrum uh, that we're going to talk a bit later uh, as well as next week. Now, a uh, second method where we can use to solve the uh, Newmark equation, the uh, new Newton equation is the Newmark method. And uh, if you recall, again, from structural dynamics in 1959, Newmark developed a family of time-stepping uh, techniques that are based on the approximation of acceleration. Uh, and uh, these expressions essentially follow uh, these two relationships to approximate velocity and uh, acceleration, where uh, uh, in order to... Uh, uh, compute or approximate the corresponding derivatives, the coefficients gamma and beta are introduced to approximate the solution. And uh, these two coefficients, depending on the value you have, 
uh, could uh, essentially uh, give you an implicit uh, numeric method uh, that approximates the uh, derivatives uh, based on uh, approximates accelerations based on uh, two different approaches. Uh, for instance, the ones that we typically use would be gamma equal one over two, beta equal one over four, and that would be the average acceleration method, where, as the name says, essentially what we do is that we approximate the acceleration with an average value between two steps. Whereas uh, if gamma is 1 over 2, beta is 1 over 6, uh, what happens here is that uh, we linearize the acceleration between steps, and that would be the linear acceleration uh, method in this case. Uh, so graphically, uh, what this means is that uh, if you have step ti and ti plus 1, and you're trying to approximate your acceleration, what happens here is that uh, based on the average acceleration method, we assume that this is going to be equal to acceleration at step i plus acceleration at step i plus 1 divided by 2 because we average, whereas the linear acceleration assumes linear variation of acceleration between steps. And in this case, uh, your u double, uh, double dot at the random step t is going to be equal to uh, pretty much the uh, linear approximation uh, or linear interpolation between step ti and ti plus 1. Now, similar to the central indifference method, the Newmark method uh, has a certain implementation algorithm. Well, here again, you have to decompose the uh, algorithm into initial conditions, where again, you have to define a similar k hat here, alpha and beta coefficients. Uh, calculations per step here are going to involve a couple of additional things uh, because this uh, algorithm is written in incremental form. And incremental form implies that uh, here you have delta u uh, dot delta u double dot. So the next step uh, that we can compute in terms of uh, relative displacement is going to be uh, the displacement we had uh, in the previous step plus the incremental displacement we are computing for this step. And similarly, the same for relative velocity as well as relative acceleration. Uh, finally, if we would like to compute the response over, say, uh, uh, several time steps, I will have to repeat the step two here multiple times uh, till I satisfy pretty much the time step that I would like to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and again, since in structural dynamics, uh, PT could be a uh, a time function in general for shadow engineering, we would like the excitation to be the ground motion, where the uh, in this case we will replace pi equal to minus m q double dot with respect to the ground. And in this case, if I want the total response, I will have to consider also what's happening at the ground. Uh, the Newmark method has a stability condition. That's a bit more complex compared to the central difference method. And in the sense that, again, your delta t here over normalized with respect to the period of the oscillator uh, will have to be smaller or equal to 1 over pi square root of 2 minus 1 over square root of gamma minus 2 beta. So for the special cases I discussed before, if you are using the average acceleration method for gamma and beta equal to 0.5 and 0.25 respectively, the denominator here of the stability condition is going to give you a zero. So that would be that, you know, the quantity here on the right hand side is going to give you infinity. And delta t over the period is going to be smaller or equal to infinity, which is always true. So that means that this uh, 
stability condition for the average acceleration method would always be unconditionally stable. Whereas for the linear acceleration method, if you apply gamma equal one over two, beta equal one over six, then delta t over t will have to be smaller or equal to 0.551. Uh, so that would mean that this algorithm in this case is con conditionally stable. Of course, in order to uh, maintain accuracy, uh, we typically have to use a much smaller uh, time step uh, compared to one that uh, essentially the stability condition uh, tells us. And uh, that would be something in the range of t over 10. So if we would like to summarize what is the actual step that we're supposed to use uh, to ensure that uh, the solution we're going to get is going to be uh, reasonably correct, that would be the minimum of uh, three things. The first one would be the critical dt that I would get from the stability condition that it's been written here on the uh, slide. Uh, there is an artificial uh, or empirical uh, value here that you may be using, which is t over 10. And of course, the third one is going to be the sampling size of your ground motion. So if you are using ground motion, where the sampling uh, size uh, is uh, in the range of say 0 0.001 second, then obviously in that case, the uh, this one could control what would be your critical time step to use in uh, one of these solvers. So uh, what I'd like to do now is that uh, I would like to uh, consider one of these solvers, and I would like to see uh, what I could do with those. Uh, if I take a single degree of freedom uh, system, I take also an excitation, and uh, essentially I use the uh, solver to be able to compute responses under different uh, conditions. Yeah, okay, so uh, in a situation like this, where I have, say, a single story building, that is comprised of a lateral load resisting uh, uh, system. In this case, I assume uh, that this system is comprised of vertical X bracing, but it could also be a CR wall, could be a moment frame, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I can represent the stiffness of this system as we discussed in structural dynamics uh, with K, and I can compute K depending on the configuration. I can uh, assume that the mass of the entire system is being distributed here. And if I also consider that the system has a damping uh, ratio Z, but then I can compute what my uh, uh, displacement degree of freedom would be for a seismic excitation that uh, I uh, will assume that will hit the structure uh, here. So in that case, uh, Tn, uh, which is the period of the oscillator, is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by omega n. Or if I do a substitution here of omega n, uh, if you recall, Tn will be 2 pi square root of n over k. So I can uh, find out under planar movement what my building will do if I'm able to uh, compute the response of my single degree of freedom uh, oscillator. So uh, structural engineers are generally interested in the peak response uh, quantities of the uh, uh, entire response here. So for instance, if the building deforms by uh, U, I'm interested to know the peak deformation. Uh, if the building experiences a force that varies over time. Uh, force could be a CR or overturning moment. Again, I'm interested about the peak forces because these are the forces that I'm supposed to design the building for. And of course, if I'm uh, worried about acceleration, as we discussed also in structural uh, dynamics, the absolute floor acceleration is what counts. So 
If I take the uh, El Centro ground motion, this is a north-south component recorded in May 18, uh, 1940. Uh, and I use one of the techniques I showed you earlier. Uh, I can do response predictions for a given ground motion. And uh, I, for the sake of the uh, example here, I will assume that the uh, period of the oscillator is uh, 0.5 seconds. And my damping ratio here is actually uh, 2%. And uh, you see that uh, the uh, relative displacement history over, over time uh, essentially uh, has a peak value that uh, would be uh, probably uh, around four to five seconds. And if I compare it with uh, the uh, response history of a different oscillator that has the same damping ratio, but uh, it's much more flexible. So in this case, the uh, period of oscillation is uh, two seconds. Uh, what we see, is that uh, this uh, vibration uh, has uh, an amplitude that in terms of displacements that is actually much bigger compared to uh, uh, the more stiff, the stiffer system for the same uh, earthquake excitation. Also, the cycle of the vibration takes longer because this is a, a more flexible system and uh, two seconds, of course, are larger than 0.5 seconds. Uh, also, if I am uh, looking here at the uh, differences with respect to uh, damping, you see that you know in the figure on the right on the left, I have a two second uh, period oscillator with the zero percent damping ratio, whereas in the uh, figure on the right, I have a two second uh, oscillator with a damping ratio of five percent. And the implication of this is that damping ratio in general will reduce the amplitude of the oscillation, but also it will reduce the duration of my oscillation. As you see here that the uh, oscillation uh, ramps and eventually goes down to zero, whereas here in the figure on the, on the left, you see that once my oscillation gets a certain amplitude, because there is no damping, this oscillation uh, doesn't die. So, uh, if I would like to uh, summarize the effect of period of vibration, uh, we will have to do this collectively by looking at statistically uh, the average of what is observed from different ground motions. So, in general, for earthquake excitations recorded on rock on firm soils, that would be class A. B, C, and D, according to our uh, seismic design standards. An increase in the period of vibration will produce an increase of the maximum relative displacement. So what this means is that if you are deciding to use a more flexible lateral load resistance system, that could be a one frame, versus a stiffer uh, system, that could be a wall, uh, to take the seismic action, you should be expecting in the first case to have a larger relative displacement. However, you should note that the above observation is valid only on average, and for a specific record, it may not be exactly valid over the entire period of range. Uh, moreover, note here that uh, we are missing uh, very soft soils, so that would be soil E, or uh, even worse quality, um, where in that case, the effect of period of vibration is not going to be necessarily the same with uh, what I just said. Um, and if I would like to illustrate this based on the example I showed the El Centro ground motion, here you see a comparison uh, of the computed response for one second and two second uh, single zero freedom uh, systems uh, for a constant damping ratio equal to 2%. And you see that, uh, as we said, when the period of the oscillation uh, becomes larger, I'm expecting the uh, displacement here to become larger than the first one. 
And in fact, here you see a relative displacement that I compute on the range of 190 uh, millimeters. Whereas for the oscillator with one seconds, you see that the uh, relative displacement I'm computing is in the range of 150 millimeters. A couple of other interesting observations here is that when I'm monitoring what's happening in between the cycles of the oscillation, I should be getting more or less what my oscillator uh, period is. So in the first one, if I'm looking from uh, peak to peak, I should be getting more or less in the range of one second. But whereas in the second one, I'm dealing with an oscillator of two seconds. So if I'm looking from uh, peak to peak, I should be able to measure roughly two seconds. Uh, and again, characteristically, if you check other spots of the uh, response, you should be able to get more or less the same. So in general, for a broadband uh, such as ground, ground motions recorded on rock or firm soils, that would be class A, B, C, and D. The time required for a single degree equilibrium system to complete the cyclic vibration is approximately equal to the natural period of vibration of the system. I'm sorry. Note that the above observation, again, is not true for narrow band earthquakes, such as those recorded in very soft uh, soil sites, which is a completely different uh, situation. Um, here, when we are looking at the effect of period of vibration on the uh, absolute acceleration in this case, what we observe is uh, the following. If I take two oscillators where one has a period of one second, the other one has a period of three seconds, I actually consider the same damping ratio. What happens here is that um, uh, when the period of vibration increases, then the absolute acceleration generally will decrease. And uh, again, for ground motions recorded on rock or uh, firm soil sites, an increase in the period of the vibration produces in general a decrease in maximum absolute acceleration and subsequently a decrease in uh, the expected CR forces. Uh, so this is why, for instance, if you are in a seismic zone and the seismic forces are actually very low because the uh, you are dealing with a very flexible structure, it could be that the wind forces are in fact more critical because the seismic forces or forces because of the seismic action may be considered to be low. Again, the above observation is valid only on average and for a specific record, you may not see this throughout the entire range of uh, vibrations. Now, if I'd like to examine the uh, effect of damping ratio, again, by using the central ground motion, what I'm doing here is that I'm using the same oscillator with a period of vibration of one second. And uh, now I'm switching uh, between damping ratios. So in the first case, uh, I will use a damping ratio of uh, 2%, whereas in the second case, I'm going to use a damping ratio of 8%. And as we see, the uh, result on the computer responses would be that the second oscillator is going to have a relative displacement that is a bit less than 100 millimeters. Whereas the first oscillator that corresponds to uh, a lower damping characteristics will have a peak relative displacement in the range of 150 millimeters, and the same pattern is observed throughout the uh, computed response. So, if I uh, would like to summarize uh, the effect of damping ratio, in general, an increase in the damping ratio Z will produce a decrease in the peak response. And this applies not only to displacements, but also to accelerations as well as uh, velocities. And of course, subsequently to uh, expected uh, forces and moments 
that I'm supposed to consider to design my system. Now, uh, talking about earthquake loading and the effects of earthquakes on uh, structures, of course, is valuable by looking at the explicit solution of the equation of motion, depending on a particular ground motion that uh, I'm interested to see. However, as we said, engineers are interested about peak responses, not the entire response, uh, or at least all the time. And for this reason, we can use an elegant concept from structural dynamics, uh, which is uh, essentially called the uh, response spectrum, to estimate our peak forces without having to go through the entire solution of the uh, Newton uh, second law uh, equilibrium equation that I showed uh, earlier. So the uh, response spectrum is uh, based on uh, work done uh, uh, literally uh, more than 90 years ago by Biot, 1932, as well as Hausner, 1941. And uh, essentially, uh, the response spectrum is a plot of the peak value of a response parameter I'm interested for a linear single degree of freedom system. Uh, as a function of the natural period Tm. <clears throat> so, uh, response spectra are sometimes plotted as a function of the uh, cyclic frequency Fn or the circular frequency omega n, but it's also common to be plotted as a function of Tm, as I said earlier. So, its uh, such plot is for a single degree of freedom systems having a fixed damping ratio and several such plots for different values of z could be included to cover the entire range of damping values encountered in uh, Archibald structures. Now, uh, we as engineers uh, can uh, produce a variety of response spectra, depending on the response quality that is plotted. And the most common ones would be the uh, relative displacement response spectrum where essentially it's been computed by taking for every period that has been analyzed and for a constant Z uh, value, the maximum uh, response, similar for the relative velocity, and of course, uh, similar for the absolute acceleration response spectrum. In this case, we're gonna have to take the maximum of the total acceleration in this case over uh, different uh, predominant periods of the oscillators for a given damping ratio. Okay, so uh, to uh, produce a response spectrum uh, for uh, the relative uh, displacement, if you recall from uh, structural dynamics, uh, uh, you have to uh, compute the uh, response of a uh, given oscillator with a certain period. In this example here, I'm using a period of 0.5 seconds and the damping ratio of 2%. And uh, in that case, the peak uh, relative displacement, B, is equal to 48.2 uh, millimeters. So to compute the uh, elastic uh, response spectrum of the relative displacement, I will have to create a plot where in the uh, horizontal axis, I'm going to keep the period of the oscillator I will be analyzing its time. In the vertical axis, I will compute the peak relative displacement of my uh, response. And in this case, uh, the spectral ordinate is going to be equal to 48.2 millimeters. Uh, now, if I analyze a second oscillator, in that case, I'm going to use a period of one second. Uh, for the same earthquake, I'm getting a, a peak relative displacement that is equal to 87.3 millimeters. So if I go back to my plot, that would be the second point or the second spectral ordinate in this case. And if I keep doing this, so essentially I change the period I use my algorithm to uh, compute the response, and then I hold the peak. I put it in this plot here. 
Uh, so this would be the uh, case, for instance, for two seconds. Uh, then I'm going to create a graph here that is going to have the peak relative displacement in the vertical axis, and it will show me how it varies with the uh, period of my oscillator for a given damping ratio. So uh, I have produced the graph here, and I believe you all did as part of the structural dynamics class as well uh, in one of these uh, homework assignments where uh, the question essentially was asking you to uh, produce one of these graphs. So this is a response spectrum of the peak uh, relative uh, displacement. And you see here some of the things we discussed earlier that, you know, on average, when the period of the oscillator increases, generally the peak relative displacement, uh, I would expect it to uh, also increase. Uh, if instead of uh, relative displacement, I keep my uh, peak relative velocity uh, in the vertical axis, uh, I will have a graph here that uh, will more or less tell me uh, a similar uh, characteristic. So notice that if I have an infinitely stiff oscillator, so the period is zero, then in this case, the system is not going to move, is not going to develop any relative velocity. And in that case, I should expect my peak relative velocity to be uh, zero. Whereas for very large periods, uh, so if I have a very flexible system, generally the uh, peak relative velocity attains the peak ground velocity of the system simply because I have a very flexible uh, oscillator and essentially is not picking up uh, additional velocity besides the uh, peak ground velocity in that case. Uh, now, of interest is the uh, response spectrum of the absolute acceleration of my response. And if you recall here, we are interested about the absolute acceleration uh, because in cases where you have very stiff structures, uh, these ones are going to still develop acceleration in, uh, besides the fact that you know they may not displace or maybe they displace very little. Uh, and this acceleration generally is going to be equal to the peak ground acceleration that, it, that can be given from the uh, very beginning of my spectrum. Uh, notice again from uh, some of the things we discussed earlier, that when the period of my oscillator increases, again, I should expect on average uh, decrease in uh, my spectral acceleration. So the uh, spectra here correspond to uh, the L central ground motion. And some other observations we could make is that uh, for uh, certain period range here, generally spectra would give me a constant acceleration range, uh, followed by kind of a descent trend uh, as expected uh, for larger periods. So uh, a small recap from structural dynamics is that if you know your uh, relative displacement or relative acceleration, uh, your relative velocity or absolute acceleration, you can go from one to the other by using the concept of pseudo velocity and acceleration response spectrum, where the uh, uh, quantities V and A for a single degree of freedom system with a natural frequency of omega n uh, related to its peak uh, deformation D. Uh, through the relationships of uh, V equal omega n times D. And if you substitute omega n to 2 pi divided by Tn, then V is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by Tn times D. Similarly, alpha is equal to omega n times V. And subsequently, omega n squared times D. So if you substitute omega n to uh, 2 pi divided by Tn, you can get alpha as a function of D. So the uh, quantity alpha is related to the peak value of the uh, base here I'm expecting on my single degree of freedom system or multi degree of freedom system. But the, in that I have to keep in mind the uh, mode number that I am uh, dealing with. Uh, if I know the uh, total weight of my oscillator, so basically VB0 is, or peak is going to be equal to 
mass times acceleration. The mass is equal to the weight of my single degree of freedom system divided by the gravity times the uh, spectral acceleration at the corresponding period. And if I uh, substitute here into this equation, the expression for the pseudo acceleration, I can get what would be my uh, base here for a single degree of freedom system that I know it's mass. And essentially the expression I will get would be W divided by G times two pi divided by Tn square times a peak relative displacement. And of course the units here would be a kilonewton uh, if we are working with the SI uh, system. Now the uh, quantity V is different than the maximum relative velocity from the response history of the single degree of freedom system subjected to a ground motion. And this quantity, it's called the pseudo velocity because it's been approximated as I showed you. <coughs> Excuse me, the quantity alpha or A is different than the maximum absolute acceleration from the response history that I will, uh, in fact, get if I solve explicitly the single degree of freedom system subjected to the uh, ground motion. And this quantity is called pseudo acceleration. Okay, so uh, if I uh, try to put all uh, spectra together, here you see the uh, three spectra I developed for the L center ground motion and a 2% damping. And on the left, I have the spectral displacement, middle spectral uh, velocity and center, the uh, sorry, left, uh, right spectral acceleration. And I can now play with different parameters. Uh, and in fact, uh, one thing I could do is I could basically change the corresponding ground motion. And uh, in this case, I can use uh, different ground motions where I, I can see how their spectra uh, could be developed. So here I'm using as an example, the Canoga Park record. This is a historic event from 1994 Northridge earthquake in California. And on the right, you see the long duration ground motion. Notice here that the uh, response lasts about 200 seconds. Uh, this is the Yanuma record from the 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake. These are earthquakes with completely different uh, characteristics. And I am uh, putting sub side by side the uh, actual uh, spectral acceleration uh, spe uh, corresponding uh, spectra in terms of uh, absolute accelerations for the same damping ratio. And uh, there could be some interesting things that you see. If I'm interested about a particular uh, period, say one second, uh, the uh, first ground motion is going to give me something in the range of 0.7 G as a peak uh, absolute uh, acceleration. Whereas the uh, second ground motion is going to give me something bigger. So it's going to give me something in the range of 1 G. If I'm looking at other uh, periods of the uh, spectrum, here at around, uh, say, two seconds, you see that uh, I have this uh, hump on the uh, spectrum. So essentially, there is energy there that uh, excites the system. And uh, obviously, this one, in that case, would be important relative to uh, what I see on the uh, second earthquake, where after two seconds, you see that you know the spectrum drops uh, much more uh, quickly relative to the first one. Uh, I can inspect also the uh, spectral displacement diagrams for the uh, two different ground motions. And you see again the general trend that when the period increases, I would expect an increase on average on the spectral displacement. But locally, of course, this may not be true uh, if you're looking, let's say, from one period to another. But the general trend would be pretty much what we discussed. Uh, now, uh, as we discussed before, when we derive the uh, response spectrum for a given ground motion, uh, one thing that is very important is the corresponding damping ratio that I may have. And uh, the uh, damping ratio here varies uh, from 2 to 5 and 10%. So uh, if I take the LC 
centro uh, uh, record and I'm looking at spectral displacement as well as spectral uh, uh, resolution as well as spectral displacement. You see that you know when I have a higher damping ratio that would correspond here to the black line, and I'm looking at a certain period, say of one seconds. You see that you know here uh, when I have percent damping, the uh, corresponding peak uh, reference acceleration is going to be literally half of what I would get with a two percent damping ratio. Uh, similarly, when I'm looking at uh, displacements and I'm looking again at around one second, you see that when the damping ratio increases, that would have a tremendous effect on the uh, uh, expected uh, spectral displacement. And again, in that case, uh, the uh, reduction is quite, uh, quite uh, uh, important. So that uh, corroborates with uh, the uh, uh, expectations that uh, we had before that with an increased dumping ratio, all the uh, response quantities are expected to drop. Now, uh, when we design structures, and you will talk about this uh, in the next week uh, when it comes to actual design spectra, uh, we cannot keep doing this job by looking into individual ground motions uh, because. Uh, the question is, with what ground motion are you supposed to design a structure? Uh, so in this graph, for instance, I'm showing uh, the uh, response spectra uh, for uh, 44 different ground motions. And uh, these are, are represented with a green color that were uh, previously recorded at the particular design site. And with the dust uh, red line, you see that uh, this corresponds to the average or mean spectrum from these 44 ground motions. Uh, so when we design a structure, generally, we are not going to design with uh, an individual record uh, that could be up here or down there. But we would try to design a system that essentially represents more the uh, mean spectrum or design site. So this is why a uh, design spectrum that you can find in a seismic standard, and this will be discussed next week, would look more like uh, the uh, solid black line here that kind of represents a mean spectrum for a particular location. Uh, notice here, again, that uh, when you design, there is uncertainty uh, because if I'm looking at one second here, there could be earthquakes that will uh, get you forces that are below the ones you designed, correspond to the solid black line. But there could be also earthquakes that are going to give you uh, something bigger. Uh, and uh, in that case, obviously, uh, these are cases that we are concerned what could happen to the structure. Uh, so I'm putting this just for a reference uh, because uh, as I said uh, in uh, week three, the concept of the elastic design spectrum is going to be discussed uh, uh, more thoroughly. But uh, when we are looking at uh, an actual uh, design code, this comes from the Euro code, but we will cover also the spectrum of SI863, which is very similar. Uh, you see that you know the spectrum starts uh, by looking at the PGA here at t equals zero. And then there are uh, periods here that we call them corner periods, where the actual spectrum uh, is going to shift. Uh, and uh, these define the range where the acceleration remains constant, the range where the acceleration descends up to a certain point, and then descends more quickly after another point. And uh, in that case, uh, you can use a curve like this to compute the uh, actual uh, spectral acceleration that is expected on the site. And with that spectral acceleration, you can deduce the lateral forces for an earthquake event and eventually you can design the structure for these forces. Uh, one thing I could uh, point out is that these range here uh, depend on uh, soil conditions. And uh, generally, if you have soft soil, you should expect this range to be uh, wider. 
Now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, all this uh, that we uh, discussed uh, now essentially refer to elastic single degree of freedom systems. <coughs> However, uh, buildings are not expected to remain elastic for the design basis earthquake that we're going to use to design them. Mm -hmm. So why in elastic systems? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> most buildings are designed for a base shear that is smaller than the elastic base shear associated with the strongest shaking that can occur at the site, which is basically equal to this value. And uh, the, re the reason why this is the case is because we would like a building to be designed for a smaller base here than the one that is the largest anticipated on the site, because we would like the structure to uh, design uh, to provide ductility and eventually dissipate the energy of the earthquake in a controlled manner. And these are the design rules, essentially, that you're going to see in the seismic engineering class that correspond to this type of uh, uh, detail. Uh, moreover, <clears throat> even if you don't follow this type of details and you design uh, structures to remain elastic, uh, there could always be a larger earthquake. <laughs> and in this case, uh, this earthquake is uh, going to uh, uh, make the system become inelastic. Therefore, we should not be surprised that buildings suffer damage during a large ground motion shaking. And we've seen this also in the field from multiple uh, events. Now, in uh, class uh, last week, we covered uh, several cases where we saw what would be like having inelastic behavior in um, structures and their members. So here, as a reminder, I'm showing you one example on concrete columns from a past earthquake that essentially experienced uh, considerable damage uh, uh, because of the earthquake event. And um, the anticipated uh, moment uh, rotation of this column essentially shows that the uh, column, after a, a certain deformation range, is going to behave non-linearly. It's going to experience inelastic cycles. And eventually, there's going to be a strength degradation, uh, since you see that our strength, uh, reference strength here, has dropped because of the, the energy dissipation that the column provided during the earthquake event. Uh, I have another example on uh, steel columns so that you can also see the uh, damage sequence. This video is synchronized and shows how a steel column that is subjected to cyclic loading here at the top experiences damage by looking at the moment rotation uh, of the um, member. So here, once uh, the member uh, exhibits the limit of uh, elastic deformation, uh, at a certain rotation, what is going to happen is that the uh, member is going to yield. You see here that it deviates at this point because I'm reaching MY. Then at the larger deformation amplitude, uh, you will notice here that the uh, member experiences uh, nonlinear geometric instability. So that's basically local buckling. And that would cause strength degradation uh, that uh, in the subsequent cycles becomes quite uh, substantial uh, because here the inelastic deformation that I have near the flanges be is becoming uh, very large. Our columns here show another issue. Uh, since we have the axial load here uh, in place, which comes from the floor system, when they experience inelastic deformations, and the uh, damage, essentially, they uh, uh, shorten. And you see here that from the time that the ground motion uh, started to the point where I had, let's say, the peak uh, rotation, I have about 150 millimeters of axial shortening, which is actually quite substantial. So, uh, if I want to describe the uh, behavior of a nonlinear oscillator, 
I can use an elastoplastic idealization that we also saw in structural dynamics. And for a deformation U at time T, the resisting force Ts, Fs, depends on the prior history of the motion of the single degree of freedom system and whether the deformation is currently increasing or decreasing. So once you exceed a certain value here and uh, the system reaches its uh, design resistance, I'm going to call the design resistance Fy, then the system is going to uh, behave non-linearly. And if the deformation keeps increasing, it means that I will be moving towards the right uh, without though increasing the force. If at a certain uh, deformation, the system is going to unload because the ground motion reverses, uh, what happens is that I will uh, the system is going to exhibit an elastic unloading till it reaches the uh, uh, strength in the negative load direction. And if uh, displacement will keep increasing in the negative load direction, the system is going to move towards this axis. So here, this diagram shows me uh, what is the typical elastoplastic idealization, which has some similarities with what I just showed you in the previous slide. Now, the force deformation relationship of a structural component is characterized by a few parameters that define their monotonic and the cyclic uh, behavior. And many studies have focused on the earthquake response of single degree freedom structures with the force deformation relationship defined by idealized uh, simulation models. So there are several different types of oscillators and responses. Uh, typically, a bilinear hair oscillator would, uh, would be more representative of structural steel members, whereas uh, the peak oriented here. Uh, oscillator exhibits here some pinching. Uh, and uh, this is characteristic when we see uh, cracked cross sections. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, probably um, uh, uh, representative in cases where I have reinforced concrete elements uh, that are well confined. And the last uh, uh, type of response where I have a significant uh, pinching here, essentially would be cases where uh, CR dominant uh, response uh, may be of interest. So that would be reinforced concrete elements with a lightly reinforced, uh, reinforced in CR, or could be also unconfined uh, masonry systems. Now, um, it is desired to evaluate the peak deformation of an elastoplastic system due to the earthquake excitation and to compare this deformation to the peak deformation caused by the same excitation in the corresponding linear system. So what does this mean? If I design a structure to remain elastic for an earthquake and this, this structure uh, displaces to u0, it means that it will develop a force that is equal to f0. However, if now I design a system for a reduced force, how much would be the reduction would be uh, f0 divided by fy. So basically, I let the system become nonlinear when, when it reaches fy. For the same earthquake, this system is going to uh, experience plasticity. And uh, in that case, instead of landing at uh, displacement U0, it will basically experience a uh, maximum displacement that, that could be larger than U0. In this case, we call this UM. Now, uh, be before we get into uh, this uh, displacement, I would like to uh, go through some definitions that we also discussed in nonlinear analysis. So one is the what we call the normalized yield strength, which simply is the ratio of Fy divided by F0, the way I define them here. And uh, because we know that in both cases, these are linked with uh, stiffness times the corresponding displacement, this ratio is also equal to the ratio of displacement at yield over displacement at peak of the linear system. 
Uh, I can also call uh, yield strength reduction factor Ry the ratio of one over F bar Y, and that would simply be F0 divided by Fy or U0 divided by Uy if you want to refer to displacements. This is called the strength reduction factor, by the way, which is a quantity that we as structural engineers are supposed to decide uh, what this value would be uh, prior to the seismic design of a lateral load resistant system. Moreover, um, I'm gonna call displacement ductility factor the uh, ratio between the maximum displacement of the nonlinear system divided with the yield displacement of my nonlinear system. For systems deforming into the inelastic range, by definition, UM will always be larger than UY. And the ductility factor is going to be greater than unit. It could be one, uh, but not less, never less than one. So uh, one thing that you know we're supposed to answer when we're doing seismic design is what is the maximum tolerable ductility that we are allowed the system we are allowed we are allowing the system to go. So this really uh, depends to uh, the level of lateral strength we design the system uh, because uh, if this difference here is not uh, big it means that we are not going to uh, let the system experience large uh, ductility demands. So if we assume that, you know, the system yields at FY and it basically goes to delta max, uh, I have my elastic deformation here that is denoted by delta Y. And then I have the plastic deformation delta P that is denoted by delta P. So uh, M here or me for... Um, uh, defining ductility is simply delta max divided by delta y. And uh, because delta max is equal to delta y plus delta p by definition, uh, the uh, ductility uh, demand here will simply be equal to one plus delta p divided by delta y. So if my delta p is zero, then this is why my maximum, my uh, minimum ductility demand will be equal to one. So that would mean that I have an elastic system. But if I have an inelastic system, the amount of delta P is going to define how much would be my ductility demand. And this is a function of the amount I'm reducing here relative to F0 uh, to let the system become nonlinear. So if I design a system with an F hypothetical Fy here, it means that for a much smaller displacement, the system would be nonlinear and perhaps it will actually go to a larger uh, ductility demand simply because it enters the nonlinear range too quickly. Now, the uh, maximum tolerable ductility uh, defines the type of structural detailing that I'm going to uh, use to design the individual lateral load resisting systems for seismic loading. And that, for instance, in the first case here, is going to define the type of connections I can have so that I can uh, develop nice dissipative zones near the columns. Or if you have a braced frame, that will also define the actual uh, structural details that I'm supposed to use for the braces. Or if you have a reinforced concrete uh, wall, uh, the maximum tolerable ductility that I would like to, uh, to have will define the type of reinforcement that I'm supposed to uh, use here so that I can dissipate the um, um, uh, energy released from the earthquake uh, and experience controlled damage within a certain region. So these rules to achieve a maximum tolerable ductility demand are going to be discussed explicitly in the following weeks. Excuse me. And, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to start 
by talking uh, the specific rules uh, for uh, reinforced concrete walls, and eventually we will go to um, uh, steel structural systems. Okay, now, uh, if we recall from uh, structural dynamics, uh, we showed explicitly if we have a nonlinear oscillator, uh, uh, it will impact here the restoring forces. And uh, so essentially, this will come from uh, the characteristics I would like to put in here. And uh, then if I divide the equation uh, with M and I carry out the uh, substitutions here, I'm going to have to uh, solve this uh, equation uh, uh, explicitly uh, per step as I did for the elastic system. Uh, note here that when I solve this equation, I'm actually using here the normalized expression for strength. But of course, you can uh, solve the equation without doing that. So <clears throat> uh, one way to do this would be to use the central difference method. And uh, the implementation algorithm has been uh, discussed explicitly for the uh, nonlinear systems in structural dynamics. And I'm repeating here uh, again the algorithm for reference, where the difference compared to uh, what we discussed in the previous hour for the central difference method is that now this beta term will uh, have to be a little different because uh, instead of a constant stiffness here, you have pretty much this ratio that uh, essentially it's been updated uh, uh, per step because the restoring force could be different per step. Uh, other than that, uh, the calculation uh, for a time step i are actually exactly the same relative to the uh, corresponding uh, linear case that we discussed earlier. And uh, 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 the difference here would be that uh, if your restoring force becomes larger than Fy, then for the current step that we are discussing, uh, that force is going to be equal to plus or minus Fy for an elastoplastic uh, uh, system, uh, because uh, that will be the condition to essentially define when you have nonlinearity in the system or not. Then, uh, if you want to compute the response for a wider, wider range of uh, uh, time, you will have to repeat here step two uh, for, for the amount of time that uh, you need to see the response. Of course, with the actual conditions in terms of steps uh, that you have to use uh, to define here your delta t. So uh, in the next couple of slides, I have an illustration of what the effects of yielding would be on uh, nonlinear oscillators. And in particular, I'm showing the uh, response of uh, an oscillator that has a 0.5 second uh, period, 0% uh, damping, because I don't want to uh, influence the uh, response uh, with uh, damping. And of course, I'm using the LSN to ground motion as a reference. So you see that when I'm computing the relative displacement history of the ground motion, now uh, it doesn't, in fact, come back to a zero because I don't have a linear system anymore. But when the ground motion finishes, you see that there is a residual here, the residual deformation, uh, which could be substantial. Uh, and uh, this residual deformation is attributed, of course, to inelastic behavior. Uh, now, when I'm looking at relative velocity, in relative velocity, I'm not going to expect to have a residual, okay? Uh, because once the system starts oscillating, obviously, the relative velocity is going to go back to zero. And when it comes to... Um, the actual uh, hysteretic response of my oscillator, you see here that once I reach the normalized strength of uh, 0.125 that I'm using, uh, the oscillator exhibits nonlinear behavior. And this nonlinear behavior is going to give me a maximum displacement demand uh, 
that uh, overall will define my uh, ductility demand. Uh, now, in this uh, figure here, I'm showing you what is the effect of different uh, strength values to the um, uh, expected um, uh, computed response. So in this case, of course, the system is elastic because F0 and the assumed Fy are equal. That's the ratio is equal to one. Uh, here, the reduced strength I'm designing the system is one half of F0, which is the peak response of the linear system. Here, I'm designing the uh, system with the uh, Fy value of one quarter, and here, Fy value of one eighth. So obviously, in this case, I'm expecting to see the maximum ductility demands to be quite high relative to the um, uh, linear system. And as expected, uh, while I'm actually decreasing the uh, strength, I start to see residual deformations relative to the uh, linear system. And of course, for the case where I have the largest uh, reduction in strength, I'm expecting also to have a very large uh, residual deformation. Interestingly, for a 0.5 second period system, you see that the uh, maximum displacement uh, compared to my uh, nonlinear uh, oscillator is not very, very different. And uh, this is something interesting that in fact could be uh, very useful uh, in uh, design procedures when we need to estimate the uh, corresponding lateral displacement uh, for a code-based uh, approach. This is something we're going to discuss uh, in detail in the uh, uh, tomorrow, in the lecture tomorrow, but also in the coming weeks. Uh, now, coming back to the uh, ductility demand, you see that you know when our oscillators uh, are elastic, that would be an Fy bar value equal to one. Uh, obviously, I don't have any ductility demand. Uh, uh, when I actually reduce my uh, strength to uh, uh, one half, one quarter, one eighth, what happens is that the ductility demand increases simply because the oscillator starts becoming nonlinear earlier uh, at a smaller uh, inertia force uh, relative to the elastic system. Uh, now, if I would like to compare the uh, peak deformation UM, and U0 of the elastoplastic single degree of freedom and linear systems uh, for a 5% damping ratio for the L central ground motion. Essentially here, if, I, if you want to recall what we are doing, uh, we would like to compare what is the ratio between UM divided by U0. And what you see here, interestingly, is that uh, for uh, a rigid systems, so systems that have shorter periods, you see that in this case, I may have a significant amplification on the uh, displacement demand of the nonlinear oscillator. But once I get into a period of the, on the range of 0.5 seconds and above, <laughs> you see that you know these two displacements are in fact uh, very close and for simplicity, we always assume to be a uh, constant. So uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, observation because uh, it has uh, implications into seismic design uh, norms when we want to estimate UM without using a nonlinear analysis and by still using nonlinear uh, uh, by still using static uh, elastic analysis that essentially you've learned in uh, your uh, bachelor years. Uh, so in general, a decrease in the lateral strength of the system will result in an increase in the displacement ductility demand, but not necessarily because UM becomes very large, but because the ratio between UM and UY increases since the UY start, uh, becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, now, the implication of having a nonlinear system into a structure is actually uh, quite important because uh, of several reasons. Uh, this is a sketch that we have seen a couple of times. So if I have uh, the elastic uh, oscillator subjected by uh, an earthquake ground motion, as we said, I anticipate to have an elastic uh, response. 
that uh, will uh, give me uh, an absolute acceleration on the range of uh, 1.1 g, which is a tremendous acceleration. And uh, if you know you consider yourself inside this building standing here, you can imagine you know what is going to happen to you if one g of acceleration, 1.1 g of acceleration would be applied. Uh, to get an idea of what this acceleration means, during takeoff uh, of an aircraft, uh, typically the accelerations will be in the range of 0.95 g to 1.25 g, and uh, essentially it would be uh, if we design structures purely elastic without allowing any energy dissipation during an earthquake, it would feel if you are in this building that you are in a jet during takeoff without wearing a seat belt on, and you can imagine what is going to happen to you uh, if you are inside the plane. Uh, now, instead, if I reduce my force, my design force by half in this case, I'm going to have a benefit because the accelerations will drop by approximately half in this case. But of course, I will have to ensure that my oscillator uh, can deform to that extent here and provide the necessary ductility. Otherwise, if I have a brittle failure, obviously this is going to be catastrophic because I may have collapse into my structure. Moreover, if I reduce my strength relative to the elastic system by eight times, this is a bit of extreme, you see that I get a tremendous benefit in terms of the acceleration demands I will have on my structure. But at the same time, in order to achieve that, I will need to have a system that is very ductile or it can provide extremely large levels of ductility. Uh, and this could be possible, but you have to respect certain design rules that we're going to see in the class in the next coming weeks. Uh, now, design codes uh, for these reasons, essentially ask you to uh, design based on inelastic spectra that, that are approximated by reducing the elastic spectra through a strength reduction factor. And if you are in the US, this strength reduction factor is noted as R. R. If you are in uh, Europe and Switzerland, the strength reduction factor is called behavior factor and is, is basically noted as Q. So for a given ground motion, the strength reduction factor is the maximum strength reduction that one can use to limit the displacement demand uh, to the maximum tolerable ductility. If one uses a larger reduction factor, then the ductility demand will exceed the maximum tolerable. So that's why we have to be a little careful with this. So <laughs> this in the literature has been uh, noted as the known R new T relationships where the reduction in yield strength permitted for a specified ductility factor varies with uh, the period. At the short period end, uh, the uh, strength reduction factor tends to be one, implying no reduction. And this could be applicable to infill wall structures and brace frames where you have very high stiffness. At the uh, long period end or the, or the spectrum, the uh, strength reduction factor tends to become equal to the corresponding ductility. And this could mean uh, that if you have flexible systems such as moment frames, steel or concrete moment frames designed according to modern rules, uh, you could be using in this case uh, very high R values. In between uh, R varies with uh, the period in an irregular manner for a single ground motion, but it's median over the ground motion and sample varies uh, relatively smoothly with the period generally increasing significantly with the period. So there are some approximate relationships here that you can use uh, where you see pretty much what we just discussed in terms of uh, strength reduction factor and uh, period. So if you are in the short period range, you see that the strength reduction factors are not going to be very large from one. Whereas if you go to a uh, large uh, period values, uh, depending on the level of ductility you want to achieve, you will see that essentially the corresponding R value that you're supposed to use is going to match more or less the uh, ductility demand that you have. And for this, there are famous relationships uh, by Newmark and Hall, 
1882, but also others later, such as Professor Meanda of Stanford University, where if you know the ductility demand you're designing for, you can actually decide on the corresponding strength reduction factor. Uh, so uh, similarly, when you're using the behavior factor, which is basically the same concept, and we call it Q in Europe, uh, if you have a system that is elastic and uh, is experiencing uh, uh, forces and the system displaces at delta zero, uh, you are going to measure back F zero, and that would correspond to uh, this uh, point here for the uh, corresponding linear system. Uh, but if you uh, design the system for a reduced strength and how much smaller, this level here is going to be our strength reduction factor or our behavior factor called Q equal to F0 divided by FD, then this is going to uh, impose certain ductility, certain ductility demands into our system. And these ductility demands uh, essentially will depend on this FD uh, here. Uh, as I uh, discussed earlier, depending on the level of Q that you are uh, selecting, we will have to do different things into our lateral load resistance system to ensure that we can provide the anticipated uh, ductility. And this is something we're going to discuss in the next coming weeks. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture.